Discordy, The We Free Men By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 6x14 Cozy, said Tiffany, because that was better than saying how, so how sooty or how delightfully noisy. She added. Do you cook for all of you on that little fire? The big space in the center held a small fire, under a hole in the roof which let the smoke get lost in the bushes above and in return brought in a little extra light. I, mistress, said Rob anybody. The small stuff, bunnies and that, added Daft Wooly. The big stuff we roasts in the chalk pie mmph mmph. Sorry, what was that? said Tiffany. What? said Rob anybody innocently, his hand firmly over the mouth of the struggling Wooly. What was Wooly saying about roasting big stuff? Tiffany demanded. You roast big stuff in the chalk pit. Is this the kind of big stuff that goes BAA? Because that's the only big stuff you'll find in these hills. She kneeled down on the grimy floor and brought her face to within an inch of Rob Anybody's face, which was grinning madly and sweating. Is it? A-C-H. Ah. Wheel. In a manner o' speakin' it is. Tis not thine, mistress, shrieked Rob Anybody. We ne'er took an aching ship W-I out the leave o' granny. Granny aching let you have sheep. I. She did, did, did that. As P payment. Payment. For what? No aching ship ever got caught by wolves. Rob anybody gabbled. No foxes took an aching lamb, right? Nor no lamb ever had its een pecked out by corbas, not W.I. Hamish up in the sky. Tiffany looked sideways at the toad. Crows, said the toad. They sometimes peck out the eyes of yes, yes, I know what they do, said Tiffany. She calmed down a little. Oh. I see. You kept away the crows and wolves and foxes for granny, yes. I, mistress. No just kept em awa, neither, said Rob anybody triumphantly. There's good Eden on a wolf. I, they k-bobs up a treat but they're no as good as a ship, though. MMPH MMPH Wooly managed, before a hand was clamped over his mouth again. From a hag ye only tack what ye's given, said Rob anybody, holding his struggling brother firmly. Since she's gone, though, we'll. We tack the odd old you that would have did any wa, but ne'er one wi the aching mark, on my honor. On your honor as a drunken rowdy thief, said Tiffany. Rob anybody beamed. I, he said. And I got a lot of good big reputation to protect there. That's the truth o' it, mistress. We keeps an eye on the ships of the hills, in M E M R E O granny aching, and in return we tack what is hardly worth a thing. And the backy too, o' course. MMPH MMPH. And then, once again, Daft Wooly was struggling to breathe. Tiffany took a deep breath, not a wise move in a fecal colony. Rob anybody's nervous grin made him look like a pumpkin man faced with a big spoon. You take the tobacco. His Tiffany. The tobacco the shepherds leave for. My grandmother? ACH, I forgot about that squeaked Rob anybody. But we'll us wait a few days in case she comes to collect it herself. Ye can ne'er tell W.I. a hag, after all. And we do mind the ships, mistress. And she would na grudge us, mistress. Many's a night she'd share a pipe W.I. the Kelda outside o' her house on the wheelies. She'd not be one to let good backy get all rainy. Please, mistress. Tiffany felt intensely angry, and what made it worse was that she was angry with herself. When we find lost lambs and such like we drives am here for when the shepherds come look and rob anybody added anxiously. What did I think happened? Tiffany thought. 
Did I think she'd come back for a packet of jolly sailor? Did I think she was still somehow walking the hills, looking after the sheep? Did I think she was still here, watching for lost lambs? Yes. I want that to be true. I don't want to think she's just gone. Someone like Granny Aching can't just not be there anymore. And I want her back so much, because she didn't know how to talk to me and I was too scared to talk to her, and so we never talked and we turned silence into something to share. I know nothing about her. Just some books, and some stories she tried to tell me, and things I didn't understand, and I remember big red soft hands and that smell. I never knew who she really was. I mean, she must have been nine too, once. She was Sarah Grizzle. She got married and had children, two of them in the shepherding hut. She must have done all sorts of things I don't know about. And into Tiffany's mind, as it always did sooner or later, came the figure of the blue and white china shepherdess, swirling in red mists of shame. Tiffany's father took her to the fair at the town of Yelp one day not long before her seventh birthday, when the farm had some rams to sell. That was a ten-mile journey, the furthest she'd ever been. It was off the chalk. Everything looked different. There were far more fenced fields and lots of cows and the buildings had tiled roofs instead of thatch. She considered that this was foreign travel. Granny Aching had never been there said her father on the way. She hated leaving the chalk, he said. She said it made her dizzy. It was a great day. Tiffany was sick on candy floss, had her fortune told by a little old lady who said that many, many men would want to marry her, and won the shepherdess, which was made of china painted in white and blue. She was the star prize on the hoopla stall but Tiffany's father had said that it was all cheating because the base was so wide that not one throw in a million could ever drop the hoop right over it. She'd thrown the ring any old how, and it had been the one in a million. The stall holder hadn't been very happy about it landing over the shepherdess rather than the gimcrack rubbish on the rest of the stall. He handed it over when her father spoke sharply to him, though, and she'd hugged it all the way home on the cart, while the stars came out. Next morning she'd proudly presented it to Granny Aching. The old woman had taken it very carefully in her wrinkled hands and stared at it for some time. Tiffany was sure, now, that it had been a cruel thing to do. Granny Aching had probably never heard of shepherdesses. People who cared for sheep on the chalk were all called shepherds, and that was all there was to it. And this beautiful creature was as much unlike Granny Aching as anything could be. The China Shepherdess had an old-fashioned long dress, with the bulgy bits at the side that made it look as though she had saddlebags in her knickers. There were blue ribbons all over the dress, and all over the rather showy straw bonnet, and on the shepherd's crook, which was a lot more curly than any crook Tiffany had ever seen. There were even blue bows on the dainty foot poking out from the frilly hem of her dress. This wasn't a shepherdess who'd ever worn big old boots stuffed with wool, and tramped the hills in the howling wind with the sleet being driven along like nails. She'd never tried in that dress to pull out a ram who'd got his horns tangled in a thorn patch. This wasn't a shepherdess who'd kept up with the champion shearer for seven hours, sheep for sheep, until the air was hazy with grease and wool and blue with cussing and the champion gave up because he couldn't cuss sheep as well as Granny Aching. No self-respecting sheepdog would ever come by or walk up for a simpering girl with saddlebags in her pants. It was a lovely thing but it was a joke of a shepherdess, made by someone who'd probably never seen a sheep up close. What had Granny Aching thought about it? Tiffany couldn't guess. She'd seemed happy because it's the job of grandmothers to be happy when grandchildren give them things. She'd put it up on her shelf, and then taken Tiffany on her knee and called her my little jigget in a nervous sort of way, which she did when she was trying to be grandmotherly. Sometimes, in the rare times Granny was down at the farm, 
Tiffany would see her take down the statue and stare at it. But if she saw Tiffany watching she'd put it back quickly, and pretend she'd meant to pick up the sheep book. Perhaps, Tiffany thought wretchedly, the old lady had seen it as a sort of insult. Perhaps she thought she was being told that this was what a shepherdess should look like. She shouldn't be an old lady in a muddy dress and big boots, with an old sack around her shoulders to keep the rain off. A shepherdess should sparkle like a starry night. Tiffany hadn't meant to, she'd never meant to, but perhaps she had been telling Granny that she wasn't. Right. And then a few months after that Granny had died, and in the years since then everything had gone wrong. Wentworth had been born, and then the Baron's son had vanished, and then there had been that bad winter when M.R.S. Snapperly died in the snow. Tiffany kept worrying about the statue. She couldn't talk about it. Everyone else was busy, or not interested. Everyone was edgy. They'd have said that worrying about a silly statue was silly. Several times she nearly smashed the shepherdess, but she didn't because people would notice. She wouldn't have given something as wrong as that to Granny Aching now, of course. She'd grown up. She remembered that the old lady would smile oddly, sometimes, when she looked at the statue. If only she'd said something. But Granny liked silence. And now it turned out that she'd made friends with a lot of little blue men, who walked the hills looking after the sheep, because they liked her, too. Tiffany blinked. It made a kind of sense. In memory of Granny Aching, the men left the tobacco. And in memory of Granny Aching, the N.A.C. MacFiegel minded the sheep. It all worked, even if it wasn't magic. But it took Granny away. Daft Wooly, she said, staring hard at the struggling pixie and trying not to cry. M.M.P.H. Is it true what Rob anybody told me? M.M.P.H. Daft Wooly's eyebrows went up and down furiously. Mr. Fiegel, you can please take your hand away from his mouth, said Tiffany. Daft Wooly was released. Rob anybody had looked worried, but Daft Wooly was terrified. He dragged his bonnet off and stood holding it in his hands, as if it was some kind of shield. Is all that true, Daft Wooly, said Tiffany. Oh whaley whaley just a simple yes or a simple I or nay, please. I. It is, blurted out Daft Wooly. Oh whaley whaley yes, thank you, said Tiffany, sniffing and trying to blink the tears away. All right. I understand. The Feagles eyed her cautiously. Yeri na gonna get nasty a boot it, said Rob anybody. No. It all. Works. She heard it echo around the cavern, the sound of hundreds of little men sighing with relief. She didn't turn me into a pissmire, said Daft Wooly, grinning happily at the rest of the picked cease. Hey, lads, I talked W.I. the hag and she didn't even look at me crosswise. She smiled at me. He beamed at Tiffany and went on. And ye can, mistress, that if an you hold the backy label upside doon then part o' the sailor's bonnet and his ear became a lady W.I. nay M.M.P.H. M.M.P.H. A.C.H., there I goes again, accidentally nearly throttlin' yet, said Rob anybody, his hand clamping over Wooly's mouth. Tiffany opened her mouth but stopped when her ears tickled strangely. In the roof of the cave, several bats woke up and hastily flew out of the smoke hole. Some of the feagles were busy on the far side of the chamber. What Tiffany had thought was a strange round stone was being rolled aside, revealing a large hole. Now her ears squelched and felt as though all the wax was running out. The feagles were forming up in two rows, leading to the hole. Tiffany prodded the toad. Do I want to know what a pissmire is, she whispered. It's an ant, said the toad. Oh. I'm. Slightly surprised. 
and this sort of high-pitched noise. I'm a toad. We're not good at ears. But it's probably him over there. There was a feagle walking out of the hole from which came, now that Tiffany's eyes had become accustomed to the gloom, a faint golden light. The newcomer's hair was white instead of red and, while he was tall for a pixie, he was as skinny as a twig. He was holding some sort of fat skin bag, bristling with pipes. Now there's a sight I don't reckon many humans have seen and lived, said the toad. He's playing the mouse pipes. They make my ears tingle. Tiffany tried to ignore the two little ears still on the bag of pipes. High-pitched, see, said the toad. Of course, the pixies here sounds differently than humans do. He's probably their battle poet, too. You mean he makes up heroic songs about famous battles? No, no. He recites poems that frighten the enemy. Remember how important words are to the NAC Mac Fiegel? Well, when a well-trained Gonagal starts to recite, the enemy's ears explode. Ah, it looks as though they're ready for you. In fact Rob anybody was tapping politely on Tiffany's toe cap. The Kelda will see you now, mistress, he said. The piper had stopped playing and was standing respectfully beside the hole. Tiffany felt hundreds of bright little eyes watching her. Special sheep liniment, whispered the toad. Pardon. Take it in with us, the toad said insistently. It'd be a good gift. The pixies watched her carefully as she lay down again and crawled through the hole behind the stone, the toad hanging on tightly. As she got closer she realized that what she'd thought was a stone was an old round shield, green-blue and corroded with age. The hole it had covered was indeed wide enough for her to go through, but she had to leave her legs outside because it was impossible to get all of her into the room beyond. One reason was the bed, small though it was, which held the Kelda. The other reason was that what the room was mostly full of, piled up around the walls and spilling across the floor, was gold. Chapter 7 First Sight and Second Thoughts Glint, Glisten, Glitter, Gleam Tiffany thought a lot about words, in the long hours of churning butter. Onomatopoeic, she'd discovered in the dictionary, meant words that sounded like the noise of the thing they were describing, like cuckoo. But she thought there should be a word meaning a word that sounds like the noise a thing would make if that thing made a noise even though, actually, it doesn't, but would if it did. Glint, for example. If light made a noise as it reflected off a distant window, it'd go glint. And the light of tinsel, all those little glints chiming together, would make a noise like glitter glitter. Gleam was a clean, smooth noise from a surface that intended to shine all day. And glisten was the soft, almost greasy sound of something rich and oily. The little cave contained all of these at once. There was only one candle, which smelled of sheep fat, but gold plates and cups gleamed, glistened, glinted and glittered the light back and forth until the one little flame filled the air with a light that even smelled expensive. The gold surrounded the bed of the Kelda, who was sitting up against a pile of pillows. She was much, much fatter than the male pig's seas, she looked as if she'd been made of round balls of slightly squashy dough, and was the color of chestnuts. Her eyes were closed as Tiffany slid in, but they flicked open the moment she'd stopped pulling herself forward. They were the sharpest eyes she'd ever seen, much sharper even than Miss Tick's. So oh. You'll be Sarah aching sweet girl, said the Kelda. Yes. I mean, I, said Tiffany. It wasn't very comfortable lying on her stomach. And you're the Kelda. I. I mean, yes, said the Kelda, and the round face became a mass of lines as the Kelda smiled. What was your name, now? Tiffany, E.R., Kelda. Fionn had turned up from some other part of the cave and was sitting down on a stool by the bed, watching Tiffany intently with a disapproving expression. 
a good name. In our tongue you'd be tear far toin, land under wave, said the Kelda. It sounded like Tiffin. I don't think anyone meant to name ACH, what people mean to do and what is done are two different things, said the Kelda. Her little eyes shone. Your wee brother is safe, child. Ye could say he's safer where he is no than he has ever been. No mortal ills can touch him. The quin would nay harm a hair o his hide. And there's the evil o it. Help me up here, girl. Fionn leaped up immediately and helped the Kelda struggle up higher amongst her cushions. Where was I? The Kelda continued. Ah, the wee laddie. I, ye could say he bides well where he is, in the Quinn's own country. But I dare say there's a mother grieving. And his father, too, said Tiffany. And his wee sister, said the Kelda. Tiffany felt the words yes, of course trot automatically onto her tongue. She also knew that it would be very stupid to let them go any further. The little old woman's dark eyes were seeing right into her head. I, you're a born hag, right enough, said the Kelda, holding her gaze. Yevi yeah, got that little bitty bit inside oh you that holds on, right? The bitty bit that watches the rest oh yet. Yeah. Tis the first sight and second thoughts ye yeah, have, and tis a wee gift and a big curse to yet. Yeah. You see and hear what others canna. The world opens up its secrets to yet, but Yeri always like the person at the party with the wee drink in the corner who can e join in. There's a little bitty bit inside ye that will ne melt and flow. Yeri Sarah aching slime, right enough. The lads fetched the right one. Tiffany didn't know what to say to that, so she didn't say anything. The Kelda watched her, eyes twinkling, until Tiffany felt awkward. Why would the queen take my brother, she asked eventually. And why is she after me? Ye think she is? Well, yes, actually. I mean, Jenny might have been a coincidence, but the horsemen? And the grim hounds? And taking Wentworth? She's bending her mind to yet, said the Kelda. When she does, something of her world passes into this one. Maybe she just wants to test you. Test me. T.O.C. how good you are. Yeri the hag no, the witch that guards the edges and the gateways. So was your granny, although she would ne ever call Hersel one. And so was I until no, and I'll pass the duty to yet. She'll ha to get past yet, if she wants this land. Ye have the first sight and the second thoughts just like your granny. That's rare in a big yob. Don't you mean second sight? Tiffany queried. Like people who can see ghosts and stuff. A-C-H, no. That's typical big yob thinking. First sight is when you can see what's really there, not what your hide tells you ought to be there. Yes saw Jenny, yes saw the horsemen, yes saw them as real thingies. Second sight is dull sight, it's seeing only what you expect to see. Most big jobs ha that. Listen to me, because I'm Faden Noo and there's a lot ye dinny ken. Ye think this is the only world? That is a good thought for sheep and mortals who dinny open their eyes. Because in truth there are more worlds than stars in the sky. Understand? They are everywhere, big and small, close as your skin. They are everywhere. Some ye can see and some ye can eat but there are doors, Tiffin. They might be a hill or a tree or a stone or a turn in the road or they might e'en be a thought in ye hide, but they are there, all around yet. You'll have to learn to see em, because you walk amongst them and dinny know it. And some of them. Is poisonous. The Kelda stared at Tiffany for a moment and then continued. Yet asked why the Quinn should take your boy. The Quinn likes children. She has none o' her own. She dotes on them. She'll give the wee boy everything he wants, too. Only what he wants. 
He only wants sweets, said Tiffany. Is that so? And did ye gi them to him, said the Kelda, as if she was looking into Tiffany's mind. But what he needs is love and care and teaching and people say and no to him sometimes and things o' that nature. He needs to be growed up strong. He will ne get that fra the quin. He'll get sweeties. Forever. Tiffany wished the Kelda would stop looking at her like that. But I see he has a sister willin' to take any pains to bring him back, said the little old woman, taking her eyes away from Tiffany. What a lucky wee boy he is, to be so fortunate. Ye ken how to be strong, do ye? Yes, I think so. Good. Do ye ken how to be weak? Can ye bow to the gale? Can ye bend to the storm? The Kelda smiled again. Nay, ye need ne answer that. The wee buddy always has to leap from the nest to see if it can fly. Anyway, ye have the feel o' Sarah aching about ye, and no word in o' mine could turn her once she had set her mind to something. Ye re no a woman yet, and that's no bad thing, because where ye'll be goin' is easy for children, hard for adults. The world of the queen ventured Tiffany, trying to keep up. I... I can feel it no-o, oh, lying over this one like a fog, as far awa as the other side o-a oh, mirror. I'm weakenin', Tiffin. I can e defend this place. So here is my bargain, child. I'll point ye towards the quinin, in return, yell tack over as Kelda. That surprised Fionn as much as Tiffany. Her head shot up sharply and her mouth opened, but the Kelda had raised a wrinkled hand. When ye are a Kelda somewhere, my girl, ye'll expect people to do your bidden. So dinny give me the argument. That's my offer, Tiffin. Ye won't get a better. But she can e Fionn began. Can she not, said the Kelda. She's ne a pixie, mother. She's a bit on the large side, I, said the Kelda. Dinny fret, Tiffin. It will ne be for long. I just need ye to mind things for a wee while. Mind the land like your granny did, and mind my boys. Then when your wee boy is back home, Hamish'll fly up to the mountains and let it be known that the Chalk Hill clan has won o a Kelda. We've got a good place here, and the girls LL come flockin'. What do ye say? She disney know our ways. Fionn protested. Yeri overtired, mother. I, I am, said the Kelda. But a daughter can ye run her mother's clan, ye know that. Yeri a dutiful girl, Fionn, but it's time ye were pickin' your bodyguard and going awa seeking a clan of your own. Ye can ye stay here. The Kelda looked up at Tiffany again. Will ya, Tiffin? She held up a thumb the size of a match head and waited. What will I have to do, said Tiffany. The thinkin', said the Kelda, still holding up her thumb. My lads are good lads, there's none braver. But they think their hides is most useful as weapons. That's lads for ya. We pixies aren't like you big folk. Ye can. Ye have many sisters? Fionn here has none. She's my only daughter. A Kelda might be blessed wi only one daughter in her whole life, but she'll have hundreds and hundreds o' sons. They are all your sons, said Tiffany, aghast. Oh I, said the Kelda, smiling. Except for a few o' my brothers who travelled here with me when I came to be Kelda. Oh, dinna look so astonished. The bairns are really wee when they're born, like little peas in a pod. And they grow up fast. She sighed. But sometimes I think all the brains is saved for the daughters. They're good boys, but they're no great thinkers. You'll have to help them help yet. Mother, she can e carry oot the duties o a Kelda. Fionn protested. I don't see why not, if they're explained to me, said Tiffany. 
Oh, do you not? said Fion sharply. Weel, that's gonna be most interesting. I recall Sarah aching Tolkien a boot yet, said the Kelda. She said ye were a strange wee one, always watchin' and listenin'. She said ye had a hide full o' words that ye ne'er spoke aloud. She wondered what had become o' yet. Time for ye to find out, I. Aware of Fion glaring at her, and maybe because of Fion glaring at her, Tiffany licked her thumb and touched it gently against the Kelda's tiny thumb. It is done, then, said the Kelda. She lay back suddenly, and just as suddenly seemed to shrink. There were more lines in her face now. Never let it be said I left my son's W-I-O-O-T a Kelda to mind them, she muttered. Now I can go back to the last world. Tiffin is the Kelda for now, Fion. In her who's, yell do what she says. Fion looked down at her feet. Tiffany could see that she was angry. The Kelda sagged. She beckoned Tiffany closer, and in a weaker voice said. There. Tis done. And now for my part oh the bargain. Listen. Find. The place where the time Disney fit. There's the way in. It'll shine out to yet. Bring him back to ease your pure mother's heart and maybe also your and head her voice faltered, and Fion leaned quickly towards the bed. The Kelda sniffed. She opened one eye. Not quite yet, she murmured to Fion. Do I smell a wee drop of special sheep liniment on yes, Kelda? Tiffany looked puzzled for a moment and then said. Oh, me. Oh. Yes. E.R. Here. The Kelda struggled to sit up again. The best thing humans ever made, she said. I'll just have a large wee drop, Fion. It puts hairs on your chest, Tiffany warned. A.C.H., wheel, for a drop of Sarah aching special sheep liniment I'll risk a curl or two, said the old Kelda. She took from Fion a leather cup about the size of a thimble, and held it up. I didn't think it would be good for yet, mother, said Fion. I'll be the judge o' that at this time, said the Kelda. One drop afore I go, please, Kelda Tiffin. Tiffany tipped the bottle slightly. The Kelda shook the cup irritably. It was a larger drop I had in mind, Kelda, she said. A Kelda has a generous heart. She took something too small to be a gulp but too large to be a sip. I, it's a lang time since I tasted this bros, she said. Your granny and I used to ha a sip or two in front o' the fire on cold nights. Tiffany saw it clearly in her head, granny aching and this little fat woman, sitting around the pot-bellied stove in the hut on wheels, while the sheep grazed under the stars. Ah, ye can see it, said the Kelda. I can feel your eyes on me. That's the first sight Warkin. She lowered the cup. Fion, go and fetch Rob anybody and William the Gonagal. The big yob is blockin' the hole, said Fion sulkily. I dare say there's room to wriggle past, said the old Kelda in the kind of calm voice that said a stormy voice could follow if people didn't do what they were told. With a smoldering glance at Tiffany, Fion squeezed past. Ye can anyone who keeps bees, said the Kelda. When Tiffany nodded the little old woman went on, then you'll know why we didn't have many daughters. You can e ha two quins in one hive w-i-o-o-t a big fight. Fion must take her pick o' them that will follow her and seek a clan that needs a Kelda. That is our way. She thinks there's another way as gels sometimes do. Be careful o' her. Tiffany felt something move past her, and Rob anybody and the bard came into the room. There was more rustling and whispering, too. An unofficial audience was gathering outside. When things had settled down a little, the old Kelda said. It is a bad thing for a clan to be left w-i-o-o-t a Kelda to watch o'er it in for an hour. 
so Tiffin will be your Kelda until a new one can be fetched. There was a murmur beside and behind Tiffany. The old Kelda looked at William the Gonagal. Am I right that this has been done before, she said. I. The songs say twice before, said William. He frowned, and added. Or you could say it was three times if you include the time when the Quinn was he was drowned out by the cry that went up behind Tiffany. Nay Quinn. Nay King. Nay Laird. Nay Master. We will na be fooled again. The old Kelda raised a hand. Tiffin is the spawn of Granny Aching, she said. Yet all ken of her. I, and yes saw the wee hag stare the hideless horseman in the eyes he has ni got, said Rob anybody. Not many people can do that. And I have been your Kelda for seventy years and my words can e be gainsaid, said the old Kelda. So the choice is made. I tell ye, too that yell help her steal back her wee baby brother. That is the fate I lay on you all in memory of me and Sarah aching. She lay back in her bed, and in a quieter voice added, and now I would have the Gonagal play the bonny flowers, and hope to see yes all again in the last world. To Tiffin, I say, be wary. The Kelda took a deep breath. Somewhere, a stories are real, a songs are true. The old Kelda fell silent. William the Gonagal inflated the bag of his mouse pipes and blew into one of the tubes. Tiffany felt the bubbling in her ears of music too high-pitched to hear. After a few moments Fionn leaned over the bed to look at her mother, then started to cry. Rob anybody turned and looked up at Tiffany, his eyes running with tears. Could I just ask ye to go out into the big chamber, Kelda? he said quietly. We ha things to do, ye ken how it is. Tiffany nodded and, with great care, feeling Pixie scuttle out of her way, backed out of the room. She found a corner where she didn't seem to be in anyone's way and sat there with her back to the wall. She'd expected a lot of waily 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 but it seemed the death of the Kelda was too serious for that. Some feagles were crying and some were staring at nothing and, as the news spread, the tiered hall filled up with a wretched, sobbing silence. The hills had been silent on the day Granny Aching died. Someone went up every day with fresh bread and milk and scraps for the dogs. It didn't need to be quite so often, but Tiffany had heard her parents talking and her father had said, we ought to keep an eye on Ma'am now. Today had been Tiffany's turn but she'd never thought of it as a chore. She liked the journey. But she'd noticed the silence. It was no longer the silence of many little noises, but a dome of quiet all around the hut. She knew then, even before she went in at the open door and found Granny lying on the narrow bed. She'd felt coldness spread though her. It even had a sound. It was like a thin, sharp musical note. It had a voice, too. Her own voice. It was saying. It's too late, tears are no good, no time to say anything, there are things to be done. And. Then she fed the dogs, who were waiting patiently for their breakfast. It would have helped if they'd done something soppy, like wine or lick Granny's face, but they hadn't. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.